Bienvenidos al gran debate de la ciudad de las ideas. Este es el día. Today is the day. Guerreros mentales, gladiadores intelectuales, karatecas pensantes, van a debatir una pregunta. ¿El universo tiene un propósito? De este lado está el sol, de este lado está el águila. Vamos primero a tomar una moneda, echar un volado, y si sale sol o águila, en función de eso, el primero va a empezar. Les voy a decir las reglas del juego. Los tiempos, los tiempos son absolutamente estrictos. La primera regla del juego, no hay golpes bajos. No valen comentarios e insultos o ningún tipo de referencia personal. ¿Estamos de acuerdo? Do we agree? Ellos ya saben todas las reglas, pero nada más las estamos reiterando. El debate tiene tres rounds. El primer round se llama golpe al cerebelo. Your first statement es golpe al cerebelo. Cada uno de ellos, de este lado los ateos, de este lado los teístas, tendrán seis minutos for your open statement para decir su principal afirmación. El universo tiene un propósito, los ateos dicen que no, los teístas dicen que sí. Seis minutos, primer round. Van a pasar al ring y van a debatir. Segundo round, la mitad, tres minutos para replicar. Si lo primero fue golpe al cerebelo, el segundo va a ser gancho intelectual, réplica. Después vamos a tener 200 segundos, 3 minutos con 20 segundos, para que ustedes tomen nota, recapaciten, pero escuchen a una persona que esté en el medio del debate, el gran maestro Michu Kaku, del cual también le damos la gran bienvenida. Él está en la mitad. Una vez que él haya hablado, viene el knockout, y cada uno va a tener un minuto 30 segundos. Es decir, son 6, 3 y 1, 30. Posteriormente, algunos de nuestros ponentes, el que lo desee, va a tener un minuto para lo que nosotros llamamos el round 13. ¿Estamos de acuerdo con las reglas del juego? Yo pido una moneda que me iban a traer, por favor. Si sale águila, Ustedes empiezan, si sale sol, ustedes empiezan. Y ahorita voy a presentar a los contendientes. Salió. This is sol, this is águila. Salió sol, you will begin. ¿Ok? El primero que vaya a participar de ellos tres es definición de ellos, el segundo y el tercero. Cada equipo tiene su estrategia. Cada uno sabe por qué puso en ese orden a su equipo. Les voy a platicar un poquito de cada uno de ellos, aunque ahorita pasaremos un pequeño corto. ¿Sí? William, William Lane Craig es profesor de filosofía. Could you please tell us which books have you written? Well, for example, I've written uh, the book uh, Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, uh, published by Oxford University Press, and my signature book, Reasonable Faith. Reasonable Faith is a libro que ha movido al mundo. Welcome to the debate. Un aplauso para él. Tenemos un profesor de filosofía. Tenemos un rabino que, además de que le voy a preguntar qué escrito y qué quiere decir del mismo. Yo les comparto que la revista Newsweek lo ha catalogado como el rabino debatiente número uno que sí tiene congregación. Welcome, Rabbi David Wall. Thank you. What would you like to say about yourself? That I am delighted to be here. And what have you written? Uh, my most recent book is called Why Faith Matters. 
¿Por qué la fe importa? Thank you very much. Thank you. Douglas Geiter, it's also an honor to have you. Professor de Filosofía, share with us some of the things that you have read. Uh, I have a book called uh, Evil and the Evidence for God, and more recently a book on faith, film, and philosophy. Ha escrito más de 12 libros. Peso completo, peso completo, los teístas. Ahora vamos con los ateos. Otros gladiadores intelectuales, Matt Ridley. They already know you, but please share with us some of the books that you have written. I wrote a book called Genome, the Autobiography of a Species in 23 Chapters. And I, most recently I've written a book called The Rational Optimist, How Prosperity Evolves. Autor de temas de genes, de economía y de evolución. Thank you, una pausa para Matt Ridley. Who will be the first one? Okay. Richard Dawkins, you don't need an, again, an introduction, but please share with us some of your books that you have written. Uh, let's say The Blind Watchmaker and The God Delusion and The Greatest Show on Earth. Eso entre muchísimos otros. Y también un aplauso, si lo recordarán el primer año, el director de la revista Escéptico, este, esta, este gran magazine, autor de libros sobre historicismo, pero sobre todo, why people believe what you think. Michael, welcome again. Un aplauso también para Michael. Tell us about you. Muchas gracias. Uh, so I published this magazine, Skeptic Magazine, and my latest book is Why Darwin Matters. And the answer is because evolution is the answer. Ok, peso completo también. Señoras y señores, sin más preámbulos, el corto para empezar con la pelea. Six minutes. One second. <laughs> Do you need one more or something? No. Welcome. Please. <laughs> I want to begin with a joke. There were four engineers sitting in a bar discussing the subject of God. And the first engineer said, uh, I have been looking at the genome and I have concluded that God is a genetic engineer like me. And the second one said, I've been looking at the skeleton and I've concluded that God is a mechanical engineer like me. And the third one said, I've been looking at the brain and it's clear that God is an electrical engineer like me. And the fourth one said, I'm a civil engineer. I know that God is a civil engineer. How do I know? Because who else would put a waste disposal pipe through a recreational area? In Voltaire's novel, Candide, there is a shipwreck in which Candide and Pangloss and their friend Jacques are, are shipwrecked in the harbor of Lisbon, just before the great Lisbon earthquake. And Jacques drowns. And Candide is upset about this, but Pangloss explains that you don't need to be upset because Lisbon Harbor was created in order for Jacques to drown. The 1755 earthquake at Lisbon was very, had a huge impact on Voltaire because he saw people argue that there must be a purpose in something like an earthquake. Else why would it happen? And that what the purpose must be to punish Lisbon for its sins. He wrote in his poem, was then, was then more vice in fallen Lisbon found than Paris where voluptuous joys abound? He was attacking the philosophy of theodicy, Leibniz's idea that all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. And Voltaire points out, with this satire in Candide, the kind of muddle you get into if you look for purpose in everything in the world. So why do we think there is a purpose? Because there is a pattern. And I think we've been misled into, into mistaking a pattern for a purpose. We don't have good words to describe how this pattern comes about. So we get into a, a, a verbal confusion trying to understand it. But it's clear that things have function in the world. It's clear that our brains are for thinking. Uh, and it's clear that there is progress. There is progress in evolution. We see larger and larger animals and more and more complicated structures appearing on the earth. It gets set back by disasters. But then again, you get a gradual incremental improvement in the way that life 
operates and so that a, 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 a creature would defeat its ancestor of a million years before. And you see the same in economics. You see the same in human society. We are experiencing progress. Technology is advancing. Uh, in my lifetime, smallpox has been extinguished and the cell phone has been invented. In my lifetime, the living standard of the average person on the planet has trebled the income of that person. Child mortality is down by two-thirds. So there is an arrow, there is a direction, but there is not a destination. Because these directions could go in almost any direction, you could, you could throw them off into any way. And how does this come about? Well, it comes about through a bottom-up process. It's not a top-down process. We've made that discovery. Adam Smith and Charles Darwin and people like that stumbled upon this idea at the end of the Enlightenment that there is, it is possible to have order without ordaining it, that it is possible to have, in a phrase, emergent order. And it's one of the most beautiful ideas that human beings have ever come up with. And just as we embrace the idea that we can have an ordered society without having an absolute monarchy, that democracy can work. We didn't used to think that in the 17th century. We do think that now. So I think we should learn to embrace the idea of emergent order rather than top-down design. The idea that as people uh, interact together and as life interacts, as genes interact, you can get patterns emerging which are fascinating and which solve problems and which produce functional order and symmetry and beauty and all these other wonderful things we see in the world. But there is nobody in charge of the process and there is no destination. It's a wonderful journey and we don't know where it will take us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Please, William, it's your turn, six minutes. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in this debate on one of life's most important questions. Does the universe have a purpose? And in today's debate, we on the affirmative side are going to defend two main contentions. First, that if God does not exist, then the universe has no purpose. And secondly, if God does exist, then the universe does have a purpose. Let me say a word in defense of each of those contentions. First, if God does not exist, then both man and the universe are inevitably doomed to death. Man, like all biological organisms, must die. And the universe, too, faces a death of its own. Astronomers tell us that the universe is expanding, and as it does so, it grows colder and colder as its energy is used up. Eventually, all the stars will burn out, and all matter will collapse into dead stars and black holes. There will be no light, there will be no heat, there will be no life. Just the corpses of dead stars and galaxies ever expanding into the endless darkness and the cold recesses of space, a universe in ruins. This is not science fiction. As unimaginable as it may sound, barring divine intervention, this will happen. There is no escape. There is no hope. On atheism, there is no immortality beyond the grave. And what's the consequence of this? Well, as many atheist philosophers from Nietzsche to Russell to Sartre have recognized, it means that life itself is absurd. It means that life is without objective purpose. As Richard Dawkins has put it, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no good, no evil, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. Thus, if God does not exist, then life and the universe are without purpose. But if atheism fails to provide a purpose for life and the universe, what about biblical theism? According to the biblical worldview, God does exist and man's life does not end at the grave. The purpose of life is to be found in a personal relationship with a holy and loving God. As the Westminster Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? 
to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Biblical theism thus provides the two conditions necessary for an objectively purposeful life, God and immortality. And because of this, we can live consistently and purposefully within the framework of such a worldview. And thus, biblical theism succeeds precisely where atheism breaks down. Now, I'd be the first to say that none of this proves that God exists. But in today's debate, we've been asked to discuss not whether God exists, but whether the universe has a purpose. And the answer to that question is, it all depends. If God does not exist, then the universe has no purpose. If God does exist, then the universe has a purpose. On this question, there need be no dispute between the theist and the atheist. I think we can all agree with those two contentions as I've stated them. Now, if our colleagues on the other side want to go beyond this merely conditional statement and claim that the universe in fact has no purpose, then they must prove that the antecedent of that conditional is true. That is to say, they must show that God does not exist. So what arguments did Professor Ridley give to show that God does not exist? Well, I basically heard only one, namely the problem of evil. This is not the best of all possible worlds. Well, certainly all of us need to face the problem of evil, and any account of evil must begin with this question. What is evil? I maintain that evil is a departure from the way things ought to be. I can think of no more reasonable definition of evil that captures our shared intuitions. But if we agree that there is evil in the world and that evil is a departure from the way things ought to be, then we must also agree that there is a way things ought to be. But if there is a way things ought to be, then there must be some transcendent design plan or purpose that determines how things ought to be. And so there must be some transcendent being, a creator in fact, whose will is the basis for how things ought to be. And hence, evil is actually evidence that God does exist. If atheists are right and God does not exist, then there is no design plan, hence no way things ought to be, hence no departure from the way things ought to be, and hence no evil. But does anyone here really want to claim that evil does not exist? So I don't think we've heard any good reason to think that God does not exist. Indeed, the theist is not committed to Leibniz's claim that this is the best of all possible worlds. Now, time doesn't permit me to develop in my opening statement a, ca a case for theism. Let me simply list the arguments which I have defended in my published work. Number one, God is the best explanation for why anything exists rather than nothing. Two, God is the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. Three, God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe for intelligent life. Four, God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world, including evil. And five, the very possibility of God's existence entails that God exists. If you're interested in a detailed discussion of these arguments, Time is out. I'm sorry. see my book, Reasonable Time is Faith. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Michael Shermer. Where's that Rocky music? Good morning. As Thomas Huxley said, Richard, the good Lord has delivered them into our hands. <laughs> I am the publisher of this magazine, Skeptic Magazine. By chance, and that's all it is, our latest issue is on the pseudoscience and nonsense of the whole happiness purpose movement. That is, once you believe that the universe somehow has a design purpose for us and us alone, that I can have anything I want, all I have to do is wish it, pray for it, ask for it, and it will appear, the Mercedes in my driveway, the healing of my aunt's cancer, or miracles to appear upon my wish. That's just pure nonsense. There is not a shred of evidence that any of this is actually true. It's wishful thinking. And that's the problem of thinking that the universe has some design just for us. However, I'm a scientist. I'm willing to look at new data, some evidence. So here's an example, guys. Um, if you could have God 
grow some new limbs of amputees of soldiers in the Iraq war, Christian soldiers with Christian families praying for them to be healed, I would seriously consider that and changing my mind. So far, this has not happened, not even once. Apparently, God can't even do what amphibians can do in growing new limbs. If there's a purpose, surely we would see at least one sign like this, and yet we have zero. Okay, so then what is our purpose? We come from stardust. All of the elements of which we are made out of were cooked inside stars, coalesced into new solar systems like ours, and here we are, complex organisms. For three and a half billion years, life has evolved from one generation to the next, not one broken chain in this long link. Darwin said, instead of finding this to be depressing, as our opponents think, this is a, a grim worldview, in fact, it's an ennobling worldview. Darwin said, when I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long ago, they seem to me to become ennobled. It's ennobling to think how fortunate we are to be part of that three and a half billion year long chain. We are an integral link in that. What could be more uplifting than that? But there goes more than that. We have big brains. We do many different things to contribute to this lineal descent of getting our genes into the next generation. And in fact, there's a science that studies this, that is what makes people happy, fulfilled, and feeling like they have purpose. There are four things you can do. One, deep love, family commitment, commitment to another person. Even a person of the same gender, by the way. And that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if this is an issue in Mexico, but it's a big issue in the United States. To think that you would condemn somebody for their nature and, de and deny them the opportunity for deep love and marriage just because they're different from you. How unchristian is that? And yet that is the position they take. Two, meaningful work and career. That is, doing something productive makes people feel fulfilled, happy, and have a sense of purpose. Not just to make money, but to actually do something in the world that makes a difference. Three, we're a social primate species. How we interact with other people matters. So the third thing you can do is be involved socially, politically, in your community. Not just your family and your extended family, but people you don't know, strangers, manning the soup kitchen, volunteering for nonprofits, helping other people in some way. This is one of the most important things that people report makes them feel better, happy, fulfilled, giving deep purpose in their life. And finally, four, some sense of transcendency, something beyond you. Now, religion claims this as their monopoly, their exclusive rights to the idea of being spiritually fulfilled. This is nonsense. The religious worldview is so small, so medieval, and it's just tiny little proscenium right here, the stage on earth of which we're acting out this drama just for some grand life to come. No, that's not what counts. What counts is the here and now. If there is no afterlife, if there is no God, how important it is now what you do. Now is what it counts. Your relationships with other people now is what counts and matters. Not so you can chalk up some points for the next life to get a bonus and move up the, the ranks into some special country club on, on high. No, what you do now matters. And I will finish mine with a quote from Helen Keller. Most of you probably know Helen Keller, who was blind, deaf, and dumb, 1930s, who found deep significance, wrote, I know no study that will take you nearer the way to happiness than the study of nature. And I include in the study of nature not only things and their forces, but mankind and their ways and the molding of the affections and the will into an earnest desire not only to be happy but to create happiness and it all comes down to this the simplest way to be happy Time out. is to do Time good out. do good
Rabbi David Wolpe, welcome to the ring. I think that it is wonderful and intriguing that we have such tremendous, brilliant energy, all devoted to explaining why we have no purpose. And I want to present the possibility that we do, first of all, not only because this world, this universe, because remember, the question is not do you have a purpose, but does the universe have a purpose? Not only because this universe is balanced on a knife edge, there are all the cosmological constants, which if you changed even by a fraction, would plunge us into darkness forever. Not only because the universe is so finely tuned and finely designed, but because all of you, all of us, have inside of us this remarkable mechanism that is able to comprehend the mechanisms of the universe. Because you can, with your mind, embrace that which is larger than you, than your life, than this world. Because your mind can actually discover the laws that operate the universe. Steven Weinberg, the physicist who would be sitting on this side of the table or of the boxing ring where he here, said, the more we comprehend the universe, the more meaningless it seems. But of course, that's almost a contradiction because you can't comprehend it if it's meaningless. Nonsense can't be comprehended. Only meaning and order and purpose can be understood. And the very endeavor of science is about the idea that the world is about something. If it's not about anything, then how could we study it? How could we understand it? And that leads, of course, to the third point. In addition to the fact that the world is fine-tuned that we can understand it, it is that the world operates according to laws. And that's an astonishing thing that we are so used to that we don't realize how amazing it is that the world operates according to fixed laws. That alone should awaken our wonder. And wonder is a critical part of what we have to understand about this debate. Yesterday, we heard an erudite, entertaining, and combative talk from Professor Dawkins that proved that religion does not work according to the canons of science. And Michael Shermer got up and said, where is the evidence? If you would regrow a limb, I would believe it, as though, again, religion is supposed to operate like science. But I want to remind you that science is not the only mode of knowing. It's not the only paradigm for understanding. In fact, everybody here, in that which matters most to you in your life, relies on something other than science. Why do you get up in the morning? Is life worth living? Whom do you choose to love? And why do you believe love matters? Those are not scientific questions, and yet you live your life by those questions. We shouldn't think that if you can't put it in a test tube, or you can't see it in a microscope, or you can't spot it in a telescope, then it doesn't matter and it doesn't exist. We live our lives by intangibles, by poetry, by love, by dreams, by aspiration, and these things are not susceptible to repeat experiments, to disproof. When we talk about whether the universe has a purpose, you can't locate that simply by doing astrophysical experiments. That's not how you find whether the universe has a purpose. Now, you might say the universe has a purpose the way the kitchen has a meal. That is, it contains all the ingredients you need. But we're not asking if the universe has purposes. We agree to that. We're asking whether the universe has a purpose. And as my colleague said, in order to believe that, you have to believe that the universe has a purposer, somebody who generates that purpose. And we may not know what the purpose is, and we may never understand it. But remember, experiments are not the only ways of understanding. And here, I want to take the motto of this conference, and I want to extend it a little bit 
and suggest to you that you consider it carefully. The motto of the conference is, don't believe everything you think. And I think that makes sense because sometimes, just sometimes, about the central questions of life, you should believe what you believe. Thank you. Richard Dawkins, please to the ring. My colleague, Peter Atkins, whose works I recommend to you, I think that it's high time that a scientist won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and Peter Atkins would be my nominee for that. He was once invited to give a lecture in Windsor Castle, which, as you know, is one of the homes of the British monarch. And at the end of his lecture, Prince Philip said, you scientists are awfully good at answering the how questions, but what about the why question? And Peter Atkins said, sir, the why question is just a silly question. <laughs> we humans are obsessed with purpose. It seems perfectly natural when we're presented with an object to say, what's it for? It starts in childhood. Uh, the psychologist Deborah Kellerman has investigated this very interestingly with children, offering them a question like, why do you think these rocks are pointy? Is it because of some uh, geological explanation, geological cause, or is it so that animals could scratch on them when they get itchy? And below a certain age, I think it's about six, most children answer with the teleological answer, answer with the, the purpose question. Yes, they're pointy so that animals can scratch on them when they get itchy. Children then mostly grow out of that purposive way of looking at the world, but not apparently everybody. In medieval times, I was about to try to work this, who's good with iPads? I'm trying to get, oh, here we are, okay. In medieval times, uh, divines would look at living things and see purpose for human benefit in them. In the 19th century, the Reverend William Paley thought that the louse was an indispensable incentive to cleanliness. Savage beasts, according to an Elizabethan bishop, fostered human courage and provided useful training for war. Horseflies, for an 18th century writer, were created so that men should exercise their wits and industry to guard themselves against them. Lobsters were given hard shells so that before eating them we could benefit from the improving exercise of cracking their claws. Another medieval writer thought that weeds were there to benefit us. It's so good for our spirit to have to work hard pulling them up. Now, it's not difficult to see that such people would also have found purpose in the physical world, in, in mountains. What's the purpose of a mountain? What's the purpose of a stream? We humans love to see purpose everywhere. And it's one of the great achievements of science. I think especially Darwin, but other scientists as well, to show that the impulse that we have to see purpose in anything doesn't work. And he did it not with the easy things like mountains. I mean, essentially any fool could see that mountains don't have a purpose. He did it with living things. And living things on the face of it have purpose written all over them. We look at a bird's wing, an engineer looks at a bird's wing, an albatross wing, say, and sees that it's perfectly designed for uh, the particular way of flying that albatrosses have. Swifts have a different way. You look at an eye, you look at a heart, you look at a kidney. Everything looks designed. The Reverend William Paley himself, uh, who was one of the earliest 
um, one of the most coherent, I should say, um, advocates of this point of view, elevated the living world as being the most important place where you can find evidence for, as he thought, a deity. He don't look at astronomy, he said, look at living things. But what Darwin did was to show that even the worst case, even the most difficult case, that's the living case, has a perfectly rational, simple explanation. You do not need to resort to the idea of a designer. That was an astonishing intellectual achievement. Something as complicated as an eye, something as complicated as a heart, even a brain. Who would have thought that by the laws of physics, unaided, unviolated, just filtered through this brilliant process of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, that the blind laws of physics could produce the illusion of design as complicated and as persuasive as we see in the living world. Well, our colleagues on the other side have probably mostly given up on the living world. That was their happy hunting ground. That was the best place for them to operate as Paley recognized. So they've been forced back now into places like the origin of the cosmos, the origin of the universe. And they like to point to the origin of the universe and say, well, science can't explain the Big Bang, or science can't explain where the laws of physics come from. Physicists are working on that. That's what scientists do. They don't lie down and pathetically say, oh, we don't understand it, so God did it. Scientists actually work on the problem. They set to work, they roll up their sleeves, and they work on the problem. One day, physics will answer those deep questions. And even if it doesn't, even if physics doesn't answer those questions, what on earth makes you think that religion can? Thank you very much. Douglas Gowick, please to the ring. Y buenos días, Puebla. Me da mucho gusto estar aquí con ustedes, platicando en poquito español y participando en este debate. Prefiero hablar en español, pero es mejor para todos nosotros si hablo inglés. Bueno, <laughs> empiezo en inglés. The three of us here hold that life and the universe do have a purpose, but only if God exists. Recall the two contentions that William Lane Craig mentioned in his presentation. Number one, if God does not exist, then the universe has no purpose. And two, if God does exist, then the universe does have a purpose. He spoke of this God as the God of biblical monotheism for a reason, and that is that this God is a God who does more than exist. The God of biblical theism purposefully created the universe. This God also created human persons in the divine image. And so God has endowed human beings with certain properties and capacities, including rationality, demonstrated here today, consciousness, felt by each one of you, capacities for interpersonal relationship, moral responsibility, and freedom of self-determination. You are free to choose whether to be here today or not. And God continues to be personally interested in the lives of all individuals, whether or not they believe in God. But God has made special provision for loving relationship with those who endeavor to please God by doing God's will. Cheerful obedience to the loving will of God fulfills the highest ideal of living a purposeful, meaningful, deeply fulfilling life. Now, our colleagues here may agree with our two main contentions. If they agree, though, with these two claims, then presumably they believe that the universe has no purpose. And so it seems from the things that they've said in their opening statements, and this because they believe that God does not exist. But let's suppose that they disagree with our first contention and that they hold that life and the universe do have a purpose, even if God does not exist. Like us, they need to say something about what this purpose is and 
Michael Shermer attempted to say that, but of course, many of the practical suggestions that he gave about how to live our lives for purposeful aims are things that theists and atheists can agree to. I would like to know what is distinctive about the atheistic point of view. If the universe exists by accident, then there is no intention behind the origin of the universe. Apparent design in the universe is a bizarre figment. And it would be a bizarre figment for it to be so apparently designed and yet not really designed, as Richard Dawkins thinks. The universe is not moving toward any goal, and neither is human behavior or human history. Stuff happens, and that's about it. There is no real ideal pattern for human behavior in the good life, nothing ultimate and transcendent that gives us a lodestar for how we should pursue things that matter. Personal meaning is really whatever you can make of it artificially, if you can do anything about it at all. Now, if any of those on this side believes that life in the universe has a purpose, that purpose, I believe, rests entirely on an arbitrary existential choice at best. Now, the irony of this leads us to evidence that God exists. Because this choice that we might make without the idea of God for a meaningful existence is only possible because we are endowed by God with a capacity of self-determination. They can't explain why we experience freedom and are capable of planning and developing projects and following our aspirations without reference to a personal God who has endowed us with that freedom. So any arbitrary existential choice about the purpose of life, if it really is a choice, depends ultimately on the existence of a freedom bestowing God. And if this is true, then a choice that denies God is a choice for what you might call an absurdly meaningful life. The meaning of any life that rejects God and God's loving will is a form of rebellion against ultimate purpose. For some, in fact, meaning is found in defying God by not believing in God. What about the case for God's existence then? The evidence is rich and complex, and I as well have written in detail about this. But this morning, I wish to point out that our collective interest in this question the whole point of the conference, centering around purpose. Does the universe have purpose? Is itself a signpost for the existence of God? To be concerned with a question like this, we have to be creatures of a certain kind, a naturalistic, evolutionary account of human existence and human nature, it seems, cannot explain the capacities we have as creatures to take seriously this problem of human purpose. If we were nothing but stardust or an accidental collocation of atoms, as Bertrand Russell said, there would be no question of human purpose and no problem of human meaning, and then no point in this conference. Thank you. Y gracias. Vamos a pasar al segundo round. Antes pediría por, por interés de mucha gente, si prenden tantito la luz, antes de empezar el debate, levante la mano los que creen que el universo tiene un propósito. Perfecto. Los que creen que no tiene un propósito. Está muy debatido. Los que están en el medio, como Michukaku, es decir, que están poco embarazados, bueno, vamos al segundo round. If you want to change the order of the, of the persons that will go to the ring, is your decision for both sides. Si quieren cambiar el orden de las presentaciones por razones estratégicas, tienen, por supuesto, su derecho. La segunda parte es más un diálogo. Ya, ya dieron su punto de vista, pero ahora hay que rebatir el punto de vista del otro, porque el punto del otro no les parece que está congruente o correctamente bien explicado. Primero empezaron ustedes, you were the first ones to start, to begin. Ahora vamos a empezar con los teístas. Tienen tres minutos. Gancho 
al intelecto. Now is your turn. William, welcome to the ring. Three minutes, please. Un aplauso, por favor. As I look at my notes for the debate this afternoon, I think there's wide agreement among us on the two contentions that we said we would defend. First, that if God does not exist, then there is no purpose for the universe, and our colleagues seem to agree with that. Secondly, on the other hand, if the God of biblical theism does exist, then clearly there is a purpose for universe and for life, and that's found in relationship with God. The question then is, have the two sides presented arguments and evidence for or against the existence of God? Now, so far as I can see, all I've heard from the atheist side is the argument from evil, which I answered and has yet to be replied to. We heard an argument from evolutionary development, but that obviously doesn't prove that God is not the supervisor who created life through evolution. That doesn't in any way prove atheism. Um, I haven't seen any other argument for atheism in tonight's debate. So while we can agree that if God does not exist, life has no purpose, we've not heard any good or compelling evidence for the antecedent of that conditional, that God does not exist. By contrast, I think we've heard uh, ten arguments that I list uh, for the existence of God. The argument from why anything exists rather than nothing, the argument from the beginning of the universe, the argument from the fine-tuning of the universe for life, the argument from objective moral values, the argument from the possibility of God's existence, David Wolpe's argument from the comprehensibility of the universe, number eight, the argument from the law-like structure of the universe, number nine, Doug Guybet's argument from the nature of existential choice, and finally, number 10, the very nature of, the hum of human beings is capable of asking questions of, of purpose. All of these, I think, constitute a powerful cumulative case for thinking that there is a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute moral goodness and in relationship with whom we can find the purpose and meaning of the universe. I think the most reprehensible position represented in tonight's debate is Richard Dawkins' claim that why questions are just silly. These are the deepest existential questions that human beings can ask and refuse to refuse to ask such why questions is to reduce human being to mere animals, which is, of course, exactly what Professor Dawkins believes. We're just animated chunks of matter in motion. Uh, love, questions of meaning, and so forth, they're all ultimately just spin-offs of the blind bioevolutionary process. But if God exists, then clearly these are meaningful questions. These are vital questions for the nature of human existence and destiny. The tragedy would be that if God does exist and you miss his purpose for your life because you think these are silly questions and therefore don't need to think about them would be the ultimate tragedy. Matt? I'm only hearing straw men. I'm hearing the, that there's wide agreement that, that uh, God, if, if, if the universe is not to have a purpose, then it must mean that God doesn't exist. But I think the universe doesn't have a purpose, not because I think God doesn't exist, but because I look at the universe and conclude that the universe doesn't have a purpose. It's nothing to do with whether God exists or not. We can go on to discuss that as well, but it's, not, it, 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 it's simply wrong to say that we've agreed that the universe will have a purpose if God exists. And I've also heard it said that it's not possible to live a fulfilling life without a freedom bestowing God. Well, I think that's a terrible uh, mistake. And there are lots of us who live extremely fulfilling lives with a wonderfully purposeful experience uh, in which we do our own purposes, but that doesn't mean the universe has a purpose and it doesn't mean that there's a freedom bestowing God. I've heard it's a bizarre figment that, that, that things seem to have a purpose, that there, are function, that there is function and order in the, in the world. Um, uh, I don't think it's a bizarre figment at all. I think we've amply demonstrated that it's quite possible to have order and pattern and complexity in the world without there being a destination and without there being a top-down designer. And we've heard from Rabbi Wolpe that, uh, you ha that 
people live their lives by things other than science. Uh, and rightly so, of course they do. But that doesn't mean that we can find in that other than science the definition of God. That's the God of the gaps. I mean, I could just as easily say the great spaghetti monster uh, is therefore exists because um, uh, you live your life by more than science. The search for the purpose in life is a bit like the search for the secret of life itself, which theology thought it had a stranglehold on for many centuries. And then as science began to investigate, first of all, it fell back to saying, well, yes, there's special chemicals for life, but then they synthesized urea, and that, idea, that argument went out the window. So then they said, well, there's going to be special protoplasm. There's something mystical and irreducible in living organisms that is not present in non-living. And then we found that a very simple chemical called DNA actually explained everything we needed to explain. And then we said, well, the genetic code is going to be very special. It's going to have unusual features that we will never be able to understand, but it turned out to be a simple linear digital recombination. And then we found that the genetic code was a frozen accident. And then we looked for special human genes and we didn't find them. We found we've got the same 21,000 genes as a mouse. We just use them in a different pattern and a different order. So I think the search for a purpose in life is like the search for the secret of life. It's simply retreating. They're retreating step after step to try and find it in physics, to try and find it in the Big Bang, to try and find it in the initial conditions of the universe. Anywhere where at the moment we can't understand something. But to say that the purpose of life is not to understand something doesn't seem to me to be a very satisfying answer. David, please. I couldn't agree more. It's not a satisfying answer to say that the purpose of life is what we don't understand. But it does seem to me that in some sense, what all of this comes down to is what you believe about yourself. If you think you are an accident of ancient chemistry and you believe that you are entirely composed of matter and there is nothing intangible about you and there is nothing spiritual about you, nothing ineffable about you, nothing that isn't ultimately material, then you must believe that the universe as a whole has no purpose because we know that the universe is composed of things that are purposeful and seem to be purposeless, all of that, but what about you? Does the universe speak to you on some level? And here, as much as you might think that someone can answer this reductively, that someone can say, well, look, it's all about your DNA and it's all about the way in which the stardust eventually, by a long process that we call evolution, whether it's in physics as an evolution or in biology resulted in you, if that's your explanation for what you are, then yeah, the universe did not certainly intend to create you, it didn't intend anything and it has no purpose. But you might cling to the thought, not that human beings are the only special creation in the universe and there might not be a great proliferation of life elsewhere, but that there is something special about you. That when you look in the eyes of somebody you love, you see more than something that is just a collocation of atoms that is here for a brief crack of light between two darknesses. You might actually have a poetic and spiritual understanding of what it means to be a human being, and you might be unwilling to have that robbed by somebody who sees you in reductive and material terms. You might think that you have a relationship with God that you can't put on a blackboard that you can't explain, that you can't account for, but that is real, just like the love that you feel for the people in your life who are dear to you. And what I guess I'm saying to you, and maybe what this divide is really about, is whether you think the universe is a mystery or a puzzle. If you think it's a puzzle, then you think it's susceptible to rational explanation, and one day we'll figure it out if we're only smart enough and we try hard enough and we're not pathetically lazy, as we religious people were called a moment ago. But let me tell you what we lazy people think. We think it's a mystery. 
we think we'll never figure it out. We think it's about God. Michael Shermer. Well, I think we need to clarify a, uh, a couple of words here. When we talk about does the universe have a purpose, obviously not. The universe is mostly just stars and planets and comets and other stuff. But just take stars, for example. There's hundreds of billions of them in our galaxy. There's hundreds of billions of galaxies. Most of the universe is just stars. All they're doing is converting hydrogen into helium under great pressure and heat. That's it. They're not sitting there thinking, I got to give Michael Shermer some purpose here because, you know, if, if I don't, he's, he's going to kill himself or something. No, they're just converting hydrogen into helium. Gentlemen, we're in agreement on this. You know this is true. What you're arguing is that because I can't think of any purpose outside of stars burning hydrogen into helium, therefore, there has to be a God. We're not debating whether there's a God or not. Don't you think what, even if there isn't a God, that you should find some purpose? This is, in a way, a kind of argument from ignorance. Uh, because there is no answer, therefore there must be a God. Or the argument from personal incredulity. Because I can't think of an answer, therefore there has to be a God. So what they're arguing is that because I can't think of a purpose outside of God, therefore there must be a God. Gentlemen, Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. Either way, don't you think you ought to roll up your sleeves and see if you can figure out some useful things to do to give yourself purpose outside of God? Don't you think that's worthwhile? I used to be on this side. I went to Pepperdine University. It's a Church of Christ school. I was a born-again evangelical Christian for seven years. I believed that argument until I gave it a little thought and thought, wait a minute, shouldn't I be doing these nice things for other people? Shouldn't I be finding love and commitment to somebody, a meaningful career, helping my social community and being involved in politics, trying to transcend myself and do something outside of my, shouldn't I be doing those things anyway? So here's my challenge for you gentlemen. Let's just do a thought experiment here for just a moment. Just pretend there is no God. Did you just lose your purpose in life? Don't you think you should be doing these good things anyway? If it, if it turns out there is no God, gentlemen, really, would you stop doing the things you're doing? Would you stop being loving to your spouses? Would you quit being nice to other people? Would you rape, pillage, and steal? No, I don't think so. I think you're doing this anyway, even if there is no God. So just try it on. Just try it on for just an hour here. Try on the atheist cap. Just see how it feels. Nothing will change. You'll still have meaning and purpose in life. Thank you. Douglas. Douglas, it's, it's your turn. No? The three of you have... Please. Excuse me for that. Matt Ridley, who spoke earliest, spoke of pattern versus purpose and suggested that what we have demonstrated is pattern, but what we can't observe is purpose. There's function as a function of pattern, but still no purpose towards which these things are moving. And then he spoke of progress. We are experiencing progress. Progress in our scientific understanding of the world and in our use of this understanding in developing technology that helps us make our way in the world. But what is this idea of progress if it's not a concept of value? Something that is ultimately of some good value. What, what makes this a point of progress unless it's just simply change? movement from one state to another. It has to be progress only on the condition that the movement is towards something better. And the idea of better in, imports the notion of value. But it seems to me that his conception of pattern without purpose leaves no room for value. 
He says, we do not agree that life has purpose if there is a God, but he didn't give us an argument that life does not have purpose even if God exists. So I'm not sure why he would assert that without any support if that's what he believes. He says that it's been amply demonstrated that it's possible for all of the patterns that we see in the world to be produced from the bottom up. Well, that's a lot different than saying that we know that it's true. I'm not sure we know that it's possible. He hasn't demonstrated that. He's just saying we do know that it's possible. And I'm saying we don't know that it's possible, but even if we did know it's possible, that wouldn't tell us that's what we should believe because something else might also be possible, namely a top-down explanation, which is actually a better explanation, and that's what we've been arguing. So it's not good enough to say this is possible. Now, Michael Shermer has said that it's obvious that the universe has no purpose, that all that stars do is convert hydrogen, uh, is, is convert hydrogen into helium. But let's put it this way, if stars weren't doing that sort of thing, you and I wouldn't exist. And so it does matter whether these things do exist, these stars, and have the properties they do, and whether the laws of nature are as they are. Turning to Richard Dawkins, I was really surprised to hear him speak of the horseflies and the lobsters, picking the really easy, you know, cherry-picking the really easy cases of medieval belief as to why these things exist. And, you know, it's good for a laugh, but I think uh, people who believe that the universe has a purpose are bound to have the last laugh when responding to any naturalist who says, you know, everything is merely apparent design. We're not talking about horse flies and lobsters. We're talking about the whole kit and caboodle, and he wants to say none, of it, none of it is purposeful. Thank you. Richard Dawkins, please. I think the whole case the other side is putting really comes down to an emotional case rather than a rational one. William Lane Craig seemed to think that it would be so intolerable, so disagreeable that uh, we are doomed to death, that the universe is doomed to death. Somehow playing on the heartstrings, playing on the emotions, it's not nice to think that we're all going to die. It's not nice to think that the universe is going to die a heat death and uh, that everything is going to come to an end. It's not nice to think that everything is meaningless. And therefore, somehow, we, that must prove that there is purpose in the universe, that there is some sort of top-down supervising God. David Wolpe seemed to, I thought rather disagreeably, claim for the theist side a monopoly on such things as love and uh, the things that, again, touch the heartstrings. Do the people on that side really think that atheists don't love? Do they really think that we don't get a, a fantastic swelling of the, of, the, of the breast when we look up at the Milky Way, when we look down a microscope and see the amazing complexity of life? Do you think that we don't have emotions? Do you think we're somehow mechanical? The other side uses words like mere, accident, reductive, nothing but chemistry, nothing but blind forces. What our side is saying is that because of the amazing process of evolution by natural selection, we have brains that bring into the universe, maybe for the first time, that bring into the universe all these wonderful things like love and value and indeed purpose. We construct our own purposes. Do you seriously think that the people on our side don't have purposes? Do you think that we don't fall in love? Do you think that we don't, when we write our books, have a purpose in writing our books? Do you think that when we go through life, we lack all purpose simply because there is no top-down governor? We have purposes just the same as anybody else. But we have an explanation for why we have a brain that has a purpose. It's because of evolution by natural selection. Now, Mr. Craig was critical of me for refusing to answer the why question because I said, 
It's a silly question. The mere fact that you can ask a question in the English language doesn't make it a question that deserves an answer. I could say, what is the color of jealousy? It's not a sensible question. It's a silly question. And the same goes for the question of why is the universe the way it is. Wow, 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 wow. 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 How are you? It's good? So far, so good? Sorry. Ahora vamos con Michu Kaku. Michu Kaku. Wait a second, please. It's really an honor to see you again. Para quien no conozca Michu Kaku, para mí, sin duda alguna, es el promotor científico más importante de la época contemporánea. Ha escrito N número de libros, ha salido en N número de programas. Ha hablado de la imposibilidad de temas de la física, de lo que hablará posteriormente, pero sobre todo se está encargando de esta teoría de las cuerdas, la teoría M, esa gran búsqueda de una pequeña ecuación que Einstein intentó encontrar y que no pudo, y que yo creo que por lo menos el optimismo del maestro Michu Kaku tratará de lograrlo en esta etapa de su vida, que le deseamos muchísimos años y que lo logre. Michu Kaku considera que los dos lados tienen un punto de vista. Tiene usted, profesor Michukaku, 200 seconds to make your point. Welcome, please, to the ring. Un aplauso al profesor Michukaku. Well, after such, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. On one side, we have my esteemed colleagues who are 100% certain that the universe is pointless, meaningless, and there is no God. On the other side, we have another group that is 100% certain the universe has a point, has a meaning, and there is a God. One side's right, one side's wrong, right? My personal point of view is they're both wrong. What is science? Science is based on decidable statements. If I drop my cell phone, I know it's decidable that it will fall under gravity. Science is based on statements that you can test, reproducible, decidable, falsifiable. But the question of does God exist, does the universe have a point, is undecidable. It is not part of science. It's like trying to disprove a unicorn. Let's say you want to disprove the existence of unicorns. It's really hard to do because maybe some island, maybe in outer space, there are unicorns. How do you prove that unicorns do not exist? Very difficult. Now, I'm a physicist. My goal in life is to complete Einstein's dream of an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that will summarize all physical knowledge and allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. So what was his point of view toward God? Einstein said there really are two types of God, and that's the source of confusion. The first God is the personal God, the God of vengeance, the God that smites the Philistines, the God that answers your prayers, the God of Moses and Isaac and Jacob. Einstein said he couldn't believe in that God, but there's a second God, the God of Spinoza, Leibniz, the God of harmony, beauty, simplicity, elegance, that the universe could not have been an accident. So I see no evidence of God. However, that doesn't mean that there is no existence, uh, there's no meaning. That doesn't mean there's not a purpose or a God out there. I just can't see it in the equations of physics. So in string theory, which is what I do for a living, we think we have a candidate for the theory 
of everything. The theory that eluded Einstein. And so we even now have a candidate for the mind of God. In string theory, because everything is based on vibrating strings, Time out. The candidate for the mind of God would be. Oh, time's up. Just your last word, please. The candidate for the mind of God would be cosmic music Thank you. resonating through 11 dimensional hyperspace. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michu Kaku. Vamos a tener la oportunidad de escuchar al maestro Michu Kaku por 21 minutos, bueno, 20.10 pronto. Vamos un pequeño corto para que para que los karatecas mentales procesen y sepan cuál va a ser su knockout, su último argumento. ¿Listos? ¿Estás listo? Un minuto y 30 segundos. Would you mind to start? ¿Quién quiere empezar? Empieza el sol. Matt, 1.30. I agree with David Wolpe on something. I agree that there is mystery out there, that there is some things we will never explain. I believe, actually, that, that we're going to create more mystery the more we discover. Science is in the business of generating mystery. That's what it does. I simply don't agree with the final step of the argument, because there's mystery, so there's God, or because there's mystery, so there's purpose. I simply don't see the logical connection in that. I think mystery, and I think Michio Kaku's right, there's, there's mystery, there's things we're not going to know the answer to, but the idea that you can somehow jump from that to saying everything we've learned about life, about planets, about things, that, they, that everything we've learned so far has shown them to be purposeless that that's all wrong and that suddenly, round the next corner, we're suddenly going to find purpose. That's simply implausible. It's a bit like saying that suddenly, round the corner, on a mountain in Mexico, we're suddenly going to find a unicorn. I don't think that's very likely. I think it's extremely improbable that we'll find a unicorn. We've got a wonderful explanation for unicorns now. Unicorn tusks did turn up in med medieval Europe. They were the tooths of narwhal whales. That's what they were. We know the answer. So, of course there are mysteries. There are going to be more mysteries. We're creating mysteries all the time. But that doesn't prove a purpose. William. There has been a major shift in the last two speeches in this debate. Did you see what it was? We've argued tonight, first of all, that if God does not exist, then the universe has no purpose. Our atheist colleagues admit that. But now what they've been claiming is, but look, we can construct a purpose for our lives, in Richard Dawkins' words, or in Michael Shermer's words, we can uh, develop ways to make us feel better, feeling like we have a purpose. Now, you see, this just is to say that we can pretend that the universe exists for some purpose. And this is just make-believe. This is the subjective illusion of purpose. But there is, on this view, no objective purpose for the universe. And we, of course, would never deny that you can't develop subjective purposes for your life, the point is on atheism, they're all illusory. And that's why I agree with Richard Dawkins when he said at bottom, this is an emotional question rather than a rational one. I wish I had had the courage to say that. I'm convinced that people adopt atheism, at least tonight, primarily for emotional rather than rational purposes. The rational arguments tonight all have supported theism. But you cannot live as though your life were purposeless and meaningless. And therefore, you adopt subjective illusions of purpose to make your life livable. And that's why I think atheism is not only irrational, it is profoundly unlivable. You cannot live consistently and purposefully within the context of an atheistic worldview. Thank you. Thank you. 
I have to correct my own colleague, Richard Dawkins. Richard, jealousy does have a color. It's green. <laughs> Shakespeare figured that out. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, a good evolutionary reason. Okay, gentlemen, um, and, uh, and Michio, I, and technically you're right, we can't prove or disprove that there's a God, but please understand, Michio, these guys argue that you can prove it through science and empirical uh, tests and reason and so on. We're arguing that they haven't done so from a scientific perspective. That's the only reason we deal with it on that level. Uh, Professor Craig, um, we don't pretend to have purpose when we love our spouses and have meaningful work and career and do things for other people. If we were pretending, they would know. Your spouse would know if you're faking it. You actually have to believe it. It's real purpose. The real purpose we have, to finish where I began, uh, is that this long lineal chain, three and a half billion years of life on Earth without a single missed generation, and here we are. We have inherited the mantle of life's caretaker on Earth, the only home we've ever known. The realization that we exist together for a narrow slice of time in a limited little parsec of space elevates us all to a higher plane of humanity time out. and humility. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. David. Four things I did not say. One, I never said scientists don't have poetry and love and so on. I said they're not susceptible to the scientific method. That's very different. Second, I did not say that my opponents were pathetically lazy. Third, I did not say they were childish. And that's why, fourth, I did not say that good manners in argument are only on our side and not on their side. But here's one thing that I did say. I've sat at the bedside of scores of people who are dying. I've held their hands. I have faced death several times myself through illness. I know what it is to understand that you are ending your life in this world. And I know what it is to ask yourself the question, is this the only world or is the universe something greater and something deeper? We don't claim we can prove God. We don't claim we can prove purpose. We do claim that our intuition of purpose is not empty, it's not foolish, it's not childish, and it's not stupid, that when I hold the hand of someone who's dying, that I really do believe that I usher them into another mode of being. People have believed that since the beginning of time, and the fact that not everyone believes it today doesn't mean it is not true. After all, Though he slay me, still will I believe in him. Thank you. Professor Dawkins, thank you. You know, of course, when you hold the hand of somebody who's dying, it's nice for them to think that they're going to a better place. Of course it's comforting. That doesn't make it true. You cannot argue for some truth about the universe <laughs> by saying that it would be nice if, if it were true. Of course there is mystery. There is enormous mystery in the universe and that's what science is working on. To respond to that mystery by saying God did it, to respond to that mystery by saying oh, there's just some divine designer who figured it all out. That is lazy. It doesn't answer the question. Darwin provided us with the role model for how you approach that kind of thing. He took the really hard case, which is life. He took the case where it seemed obvious to everybody that it had to have a purpose, that it had to be designed. He showed for the hard case that it could be done. That's what science is working on. The mystery, when it is solved, will be solved by scientists who will use the Darwinian method, that's to say, they will explain in a bottom-up way how it is, not just that life 
came about, and we know that, we understand that now, but also how it is that the universe came about. That is the challenge of science. That is what science is going to rise to. We shall not resort to lazy, second-rate explanations that just lie down under the problem and say, God did it. Time out. Wow. Un aplauso, un gran aplauso para los seis, para los seis metros. Please, if you could stand up, un aplauso de todos para ustedes. Well, I have to say that I am surprised by what Michio Kaku said at the very beginning in ascribing to our team 100% certainty in what we have argued. I don't think any of us claimed to have 100% certainty. And in fact, I would say that all of the arguments we presented for the existence of God were probability arguments. And they are arguments to the effect that the existence of God is so likely that it is the way we ought to bet with our lives if we should have purpose. That is not 100% certainty. But I did get the sense of 100% certainty that science is the, the only source of knowledge, according to this side over here, and Michio Kaku, maybe that's your view too, I don't know, because you did say that the God question is undecidable. How undecidable? Well, presumably because you can't prove that God exists or even show his probability if you have science only to go with. But of course, there are many things we know, including that God may well exist because of other evidence without depending exclusively on science. Richard Dawkins uh, has accused us of making an emotional argument. But I believe that his presentation is especially emotional. He has not argued that God does not exist. Thank you. He has not shown that any of the arguments we, pre we presented here today are fallacious. Rather, he has simply dismissed the idea of God as pathetic. Time out, I'm sorry. That's emotional. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Wow. Ahora viene el round 13. En el round 13, algunos de nuestros speakers, would you like to, to, to join us? If, if you want to say something, it's perfect. Van a bajar con mucho cuidado, very carefully, y van a tener un minuto. A mira Axel, porque no tuvo mucho tiempo de dialogar con Jerome Friedman, le vamos a arreglar un minuto y medio. ¿Estamos de acuerdo? Okay, Jerome Friedman, uh, Mike, uh, Amir, you will have one minute and a half. Thank you. I promise you have it. Can you Todos los demás van a tener un minuto. Please, if you want to get in, pasen. Todos un minuto y medio, va. Pasen. Henry. Okay, if you want, you can wait there. But, Amir, one second, please. First of all, our Nobel Prize will, will begin with one minute and a half. Please, from this position. Jerome Friedman, su punto de vista. Uh, this has been a fascinating debate, and uh, what it really is is the contrast between knowledge attained by observation and knowledge obtained by revelation, and they're quite different. Uh, knowledge obtained by observation uh, is testable, and it's always being tested, and you can actually put numerical probabilities on it. Uh, knowledge obtained by revelation is not testable, and you cannot really assign a sensible probability to it. And that is the, 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 really the source of the great controversy. Now, the question of the purpose of the universe is the following. You know, if you say, what is purpose? Purpose is the reason for doing something, or the reason for existing. Now, this implies that the universe has to have a reasoning creator. Personally, I do not feel that I see enough evidence to support that point of view. That's my own personal feeling from look, listening to all the arguments and observing what's around me. Now, it's true that we do not understand things completely in science. We probably never will. There are mysteries that will always elude us because there are things we cannot measure. We can't go outside the observable universe. We can't go before, we can't go before the Big Bang. We cannot approach those regions. So we have to assume that we will be ignorant about certain things. Now the question is whether you have to have a narrative to fill in that mystery. Time, time out, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. 
Un aplauso, por favor, para John Feynman. Amir Axel, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andres. I'm very delighted to see that both sides here embrace physics as the answer for everything, and the two physicists here had, had little to speak. They had spoke the least. But I would like to say one thing. The way to approach the argument is a little bit, we're, we're a little bit premature, because as Professor Kaku said, we're not yet at the final theory. We don't know everything yet. And what I want to do here is to give you an idea of where the final theory is going. Professor Kaku's approach of string theory is one direction. There are other directions called supersymmetry, and we have something called the standard model, which is three formulas in his book, actually. They all have to do in one principle, and that's symmetry. We don't understand symmetry, and we don't know why it's there. But we're getting close to understanding symmetry. Now, in the last 43 seconds I have, I want to give you one example of symmetry. The electron is a very interesting thing. It goes around once, and it reverses itself. So it has to go around twice in order to start where, it's, where it began, to get back to where it began. You can try it at home. You think there's nothing in the world that does that. I go around the circle, I come back where I started, but I can't do it. There, try it at home. Uh, one last thing. There is a symmetry called SU5, which I can't explain to you, but it was invented by Sheldon Glashow at uh, Boston University and uh, another physicist. And if it's true, the universe will go away regardless of whether it's expanding and where the stars are Time dying. Out. Thank you very much. Hello. Henry. So without the brain, there is no color, there is no sound, there is no pain, there is no good, there is no evil, there is no idea of God. As the brain evolves, as the brain evolves over the next millions or billions of years, we will embody more and more of the universe. We, the human, embodies or f sees and thinks and feels more about the universe than an ant, than a cat, than a monkey, than a dolphin. The brain is part of the universe. So the universe itself has a direction. But whether there is a purpose giver from the outside is, I think, something that neither religion nor science is ever going to prove. However, I think what is absolutely clear is that the universe can give birth to a purpose regardless of how pointless. Thank you. Please. Professor Sutton. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Dan Schachter. I'm a humble experimental cognitive psychologist who studies memory in the brain. I'll tell you a little bit about that later this afternoon. I don't know whether the universe has a purpose or not. I don't know whether we're going to be able to find out. I did find this debate very interesting, the opinions expressed on both sides. And I'm going to step back. Uh, from the debate and look at it from the perspective of a cognitive psychologist. What interested me mostly was what's going on in the heads of the people on the two sides. We heard a mixture of some very sharp reasoning. We heard a lot of emotion. We heard people bringing lots of background baggage and belief to the table. And that gave me a great idea. I want to go back to my lab and start studying how people reason about God and the purpose of the universe. I think there's a lot of interesting material here. <clears throat> Interestingly, last week I heard a talk at, at Harvard, where I'm based, uh, by a social psychologist by the name of Nick Epley, formerly of our department, now at the University of Chicago. He put people in a brain scanner and asked them to think about God. And these were all people who believed in the existence of God. And what he found was very interesting, that a part of the frontal lobe so part of the frontal lobe, I'm going to show you my talk later today, the inner frontal lobe that becomes very active when we think about ourselves becomes similarly active when we think about God. I don't know exactly what to make of that finding, but I'll ask the two sides to think about it. Thank you.
Ya les platicaré mucho más de estos ponentes cuando pasen. Ya conocerán tanto a Daniel como a Doras Vitak. Por favor, Ada. Hi, um, you'll be hearing me speak today as well. One of the things was uh, the question, does the universe have a purpose? Um, I think it's difficult to say as far as the universe goes. I mean, it's kind of like asking, does this stage have a purpose? Well, I mean, we're on it, but is it going to go further? Is it going to do something great? I'm not sure. I mean, it's a stage. It's the universe. It's galaxies. It's stars. It's um, not just people. But I think a more important question to ask is, does whether the universe have a purpose or not, does that affect our purpose? My impression from listening uh, to William Lane Craig and the rabbi um, uh, to the side over here was that the universe not having a purpose took away from our purpose. Um, but I believe that, I heard the rabbi say that, you know, a purpose needs a purposer. Why can't we be the purposer? We heard about the collective brain. Why can't we have a collective purpose? Ultimately, I don't think that the question of whether the universe has a purpose will affect our purpose. And I hope that each, each and every one of you will think about what purpose you want to have in life outside of a religion, you know, to do it for the sake of having a purpose, not because of the universe. That was um, just my thinking. You're listening to it. Bueno. Michu. Michu Kaku. One second. One second, please. Michu. Stop, 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 stop. First, here I am, in the middle. Well, wait a second. Sean, Sean will, will take the word, please. You can start the clock. So I'm a clinical therapist, and you'll be hearing from me today. And I've heard both sides, and I'm still in question myself, raised as a Catholic who still wonders about all of this universe. But what I do know is that when my patients come to see me, if they do not have a purpose, they unravel. If they do not have a purpose, they perish. What I hear is arrogance on the side of the atheists, that they as believe that they are purposeful. But something as grand as the universe cannot be purposeful because, oh, it's just space and empty. So that is arrogance to believe that an individual can have purpose but something as grand and as vast as this entire space that we do not know all the answers, well, that cannot have a purpose. My friends, that is complete arrogance, and you must question it with your heart, your mind, and your soul. Thank you. Okay. Michu Kaku, please. In my next book, physics of the future, I try to predict the next 100 years based on interviews with 300 scientists. Very difficult question. But I predict, I predict that 100 years from now, on the 103rd anniversary of this conference, we will have another debate arguing the same thing over again. Because for two reasons. First, it is undecidable. You cannot decide this question using any known rational means. It is undecidable. Second, there's probably also a God gene. Some people believe that perhaps we are genetically predisposed to believing in higher beings, in which case we'll be talking about this debate forever, as long as we have our genes. Now, my colleague Stephen Hawking recently wrote a very controversial statement, was in all the headlines. He said, first, we have a theory of everything. It's string theory, the theory that I work on, and it takes you before the Big Bang. Therefore, God is not necessary because we now have a theory of the pre-Big Bang universe. My attitude is, well, where did string theory come from? It goes on forever. Even if you Time. could go before the Big Bang, then the question is, where did that theory come from? Time Undecidable. Out. Thank you. Una pregunta. Les damos a cada uno de los speakers 30 segundos más, porque se quedaron con ganas. They say, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. No, everybody say it. 
Señoras y señores, 30 segundos. Eso es todo. Por favor, relojes, acomódense. Who want to begin? No, no, no. Each of you, but if you don't want to, you don't have okay. to. Okay. Okay. Just to make what, a one minute? 30 seconds. 30 30 seconds. The close remark. Okay. okay. I, I'd like to say one thing, and then you and okay. then I'll pass. Up there? Right here? Or here? Okay. Right here? Whatever. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll, Van. I'll go first. Go ahead. Then go, you, okay. go, go, go. <laughs> you want to see space? Right. Yeah? I've never been to a conference like this before. Most of the professional conferences at which I speak are philosophy conferences. So this is my initiation to this sort of IT subculture, information technology. And I would just urge you folks not to allow the IT community to become infected with the sort of self-defeating scientism and anti-religious uh, bigotry that has characterized, for example, Richard Dawkins' talk yesterday. You need to realize that outside of this sphere, the I'm most sorry. brilliant philosophers and excuse many me, scientists in the me. world today are, are outspoken theists, and that this is a rational and defensible point of view. Thank you very much. 30 seconds, please. Last remark. Mark. I don't like hearing the word bigotry of our position. The, the, we've searched for purpose in the large structures of space. We've searched for it in the subatomic particles. We've searched for it in natural history. We've searched for it in bodies. We've searched for it in genes. We haven't found it. Yes, it might be around the corner, but it doesn't seem very likely now. We found pattern. We haven't found purpose. That's telling us something. It's a unicorn. Thank you. <laughs> David. I'm not so certain. I want you to know I have tremendous respect for the three adversaries here. I've read all, I've read many of their books of all three of them, and I think they have a great deal to say that's very important. It's not as though I come here assuming I have all the answers. I doubt all the time. Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav, a great rabbi, said he was a moon man. His faith waxed and waned, and I feel sometimes the same way. But with all your doubts, at a certain point, you have to make a commitment with your life. And so I follow the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, I fail every day, Time. but to victory I am born. Time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Matt, uh, Michael, or Richard, whoever you want. All right. Okay, so first of all, we're not saying that we're, uh, the universe has... Uh, that we have no purpose. We are the purpose givers. We are the, the humble ones in, in that sense. So, and it comes from the fact that this is what, what we do. We look for love, career work, meaningful work, helping other people, and transcendence. That's where it comes from. We are the purpose makers. And here's, I'll leave you with a, a purpose you can have. Always seek purpose with somebody else's purpose in mind, and never seek purpose in trying to take somebody else's purpose away. It's a very simple principle. Okay, please, Douglas. Well, first of all, I simply want to thank our moderator and the entire conference organizers team uh, for including a handful of theists in the program for this conference. I'm serious about that, and I hope that that will continue. I think it's a very worthwhile discussion we've had. Let me finish, thank you, with a quote by C.S. Lewis, a great Christian thinker, who said, if I find in myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy, then probably I was made for another world. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Dawkins, the last remark. Simplicity is that which is easy to understand. Complexity is that which is difficult. We as scientists are engaged on an enterprise to understand complexity, and that's the difficult problem. Purpose is one of the manifestations of complexity. Purpose comes from brains. Brains come late in the universe. Brains and purpose and all the other things like love are things that require explanation and we are working on explaining them. That's not arrogant, that's hard work, that's diligence, that's going for Time it. out, I'm sorry. Gracias. Hay, hay veces que nos gustaría seguir pensando sobre pensar. Por cierto, les recomiendo muchísimo una obra de teatro, ojalá llegue a México, se llama La última sesión de Freud, entre C.S. Lewis y Sigmund Freud. Es un debate parecido a estos en un consultorio. C.S. Lewis fue un ateo que se convirtió a cristiano y Freud, como ustedes saben, siempre, a su, siempre supuso y mantuvo de que la religión es una neurosis colectiva y era ateo. 
Pero bueno, fuera de ese paréntesis, les quiero pedir de todo corazón, con el cerebro, con la emoción, en lo que crean, un fuertísimo aplauso para todos ellos. Michu Kaku, Michael Shermer, Richard Dawkins, Matt Ridley, please, William Lane Craig, David Walker, Douglas Perfect. Un aplauso para todos ellos. Sam. Para todos ustedes. Esto lo podrán ver en YouTube, en la página de la Ciudad de las Ideas, en Proyecto 40, en Cinépolis. Un fuerte aplauso para todos ellos. Excuse me, if you can shake your hands in the ring, please, jóvenes, señores, bajen esto. Come to the ring and shake the hands, please. Una foto del recuerdo del debate 2010 de la Ciudad de las Ideas. Se van a intercambiar libros y camisetas. No, las presento. Michu Kaku, please share it with us. A photograph, please, for the debate. Por favor, tomen sus lugares. Última pregunta antes de pasar al otro segmento. ¿Quién de ustedes estaba a favor de que había un propósito en el universo y después de este debate cambió de opinión? Por favor, levante la mano. Dos personas. ¿Qué pensabas? Tres personas. ¿Qué pensabas? ¿Estabas a favor o en contra, Valeria? Y ya antes pensabas que no. Cambiaste de opinión. A que no, te convencieron los ateos. Well. ¿Quién de aquí, quién de aquí pensaba que no había un propósito y ahora piensa que sí hay un propósito? Tú. Ahora cambiaste de opinión. Muy bien, pues señoras y señores, todos los demás necesitamos terapia para abrir nuestro paracaídas. Un aplauso para ustedes. Regresamos, por favor. Tenemos un poquito de tiempo, regresemos a las doce y media para seguir con el programa. Muchas gracias.